Hello Thermo fans! Let's talk about today's problem of the day, which hinges on the concept of osmotic pressure. This is another idea within the realm of ideas of things we can ask and calculate and find from having good activity models that describe the non-ideal behavior of chemicals in mixtures. And these are things we can do with activity models besides merely find the boiling point and vapor phase composition of things. So a really important big idea here is that when we're thinking about activity, if there are two adjacent phases and a given chemical has a different activity between the two phases, chemicals will tend to move from where their activity is higher to where their activity is lower. At equilibrium, you will have the same activity for a given species in each of the contacting phases. But when we're uh, not at equilibrium, the way that the chemicals try to move towards equilibrium is they go from where activity is higher towards where activity is lower. And you've encountered this already, even if you haven't done this by this name. Like that is, you know that if you put some salt into pure water, they will tend to end up eventually uh, completely mixed. Right? So at equilibrium, we've been using fugacity in one phase is equal to the fugacity in the other phase of a given chemical species. And notice this time I wrote this in terms of alpha and beta being our different phases. Uh, we've been using vapor and liquid as our two different phases, but I want to broaden this now to make it clear this applies to any two phases that happen to be uh, in chemical contact and equilibrium with each other. So it could be two liquids, it could be a liquid and a solid, it could be a, a liquid and a vapor, as we've been talking about. This is going to be important as we think about osmotic pressure, uh, because uh, in this case we have pretty much the exact same liquid, but it's on two different sides of a barrier where certain things will not be able to cross that barrier. So we can think about this in terms of fugacity, or we can think about it in terms of activity, the activity of substance I in one phase uh, at equilibrium will be equal to its activity in the other adjacent phase. So what is tremendously cool to me about osmotic pressure and the whole idea of osmosis is that we can physically see something thermodynamic. And usually thermodynamics is happening kind of invisibly, you know, heat is moving and energy is flying about. But in uh, osmosis, we can actually see this in action. So imagine, if you will, what we have in the drawing, which is I got a big old fish tank and I put down the middle of the fish tank a, a barrier of some kind that's called a semi-permeable membrane. So it's something that, say, water can move freely through, but that solutes dissolved in the water cannot move freely through. And this sounds a little far-fetched, but we know how to manufacture things like this. And in fact, you are covered in a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, cell, uh, cell membranes are semi-permeable membranes. So imagine, if you will, then in this fish tank where we have this setup, uh, on both sides we have water, but on one of the sides there is a solute of some kind. Maybe it's salt, maybe it's sugar, dissolved in that water. And so we have side one, pure water, side two, uh, water with a solute. And that solute is too big to go through the membrane. So water can move back and forth freely, but that, let's call it sugar for the moment, that sugar cannot move through the membrane. So we know if we look just at the activity of the water, that uh, because it's pure water on side one, that means its activity should be one. Um, and then on side two, it's not pure water, so its activity has got to be lower than one. So the activity of the water specifically is lower than one. And so the water is going to tend to do what? Well, it, in an attempt to establish equilibrium, it's going to flow from side one toward side two. And uh, I'll illustrate that in just a second. But you see, that's, I hope that makes sense that that's what's likely to happen. And uh, maybe in high school uh, chemistry, when you took this, they, they called it uh, Le Chatelier's principle or law of mass action. It's all variations on the same thing. Stuff goes from high activity towards low activity until uh, we have evened out the activities. Now, if you think this through, it's never going to work, right? Uh, as water leaves side one and goes to side two, 
uh, because that solute's not going anywhere, we're never going to get to the same composition on both sides. So what will happen is water will leave side one, go to side two, and side two will have uh, the volume over there increase and the volume will decrease on side one. And you will get, because of this different in, difference in heights, you will end up with, in fact, a difference in pressures, right? Because a water column that is taller uh, exerts a greater pressure than a water column that is shorter. That's something uh, you should have seen in fluids. Uh, that difference in pressure is in fact equal to rho gh. Right? So h, our difference in height, uh, rho, the density of water, and uh, g being gravity. So we assume we're on Earth. So eventually, what's going to happen is flow is going to stop between side one and side two, not because the concentrations are equal, uh, that won't have happened because the solute can't move. It's going to have stopped because the driving force created by this activity difference will eventually be balanced by the pressure difference between the left and the right. And that is the part, right? Mind blown, right? We have something that's like activity, which you can't touch or feel or smell, but activity can create a height difference that we could actually measure if we could set this up physically. That's so cool! Uh, so, this thing that just happened is osmosis, and osmotic pressure is that pressure difference that uh, exactly balances, eventually, the uh, activity difference uh, between the two sides. And that's all well and good if you want to explain uh, cells bursting because you put them in pure water or your fingers uh, perhaps getting wrinkly in the bathtub, but uh, what we think is more useful as engineers is using this process backwards, right? Because this ought to work both ways. We can uh, put pressure on the side with the solutes in it and basically squeeze pure water out through the semi-permeable membrane as long as the pressure we exert is greater than that uh, that was caused by the activity in the first place. And that's called reverse osmosis, and let's give it a try. So I started on the last slide to do a little bit of the derivation of the osmotic pressure calculation. Uh, we're going to skip that. You can look it up in a book if you want to get to the details. Um, it all eventually comes down to a rather simple equation that is a bear to implement. So this is going to look simple but you have to be super duper careful with your units to make this work. So osmotic pressure is often represented by capital Pi. Uh, so this is what I have drawn in here. Or you could just write osmotic pressure if you aren't comfortable with capital Pi, because that stands for several other things that we'll see uh, later in this class and perhaps you've seen in others. Um, and that is equal to, I think I have left off a natural log here. Oh no, I haven't yet. Okay, good. Uh, that is equal to uh, R, you know, gas constant, you know R, times temperature, it's got to be absolute temperature, divided by the unit volume of water uh, times natural log of water's activity in our system. And you got to note, a uh, unit volume of water is how many uh, moles of water are in a liter. So this tends to be a constant. You can adjust it for a temperature variation because the volume will change slightly with temperature, but we're usually looking at about 55 moles in a liter of water. So you can go ahead and use that there. But again, watch your units because remember a liter doesn't translate into meters very nicely, which you probably have embedded uh, in your gas constant. And that AW is water's activity uh, in our setup. Note as written right here, this gives us a value at a particular uh, set of concentrations. So if you were to try to do reverse osmosis, uh, you would exert a pressure and some water would be purified from your system and the concentrations of everything would change. So the pressure would also change. So in fact, if you think about it this way, the more you squeeze, uh, for example, salt water, the more you have to squeeze because the concentration is going up as you go. So this doesn't describe that entire series. We would obviously have to integrate over changing uh, activity and changing <coughs> concentration, uh, changing pressure to figure that out. Here we're going to just look at it kind of instantaneously 
at, uh, at one particular set of compositions. We are at last ready to set up our problem of the day. And the problem of the day is uh, not uh, something that is made up. It is something that affects our world right now. So if you think about uh, planet Earth and uh, the folks who live in the equatorial regions of the planet, it's quite warm there and uh, there is often more need for drinking water and water for crops uh, than is provided by rainfall. So there isn't enough uh, fresh water uh, relative to what uh, folks would like to be doing in those regions. And so a potential source of water, um, while there isn't a lot of fresh water necessarily, especially uh, where there's uh, deserts, there is often uh, seawater that's not too far away. So your challenge for reverse osmosis is uh, how much pressure would you need to exert in order to begin to derive uh, fresh water from seawater? And we're going to make a couple assumptions uh, so uh, to make this uh, problem tractable. Uh, one, we're just looking for the initial pressure and we are looking for the minimum pressure. So keep in mind uh, when we are solving all sorts of problems at equilibrium, uh, running a process at equilibrium usually is very slow, right? Like if we had a heat exchanger and we wanted to make the water be 50 degrees and on the other side of the heat exchanger our heat exchange fluid was at 50.1 degrees, we would need a huge heat exchanger or a whole lot of time, very slow flow. Um, same thing here. Uh, this pressure that you're gonna work out is the pressure at equilibrium. So to actually make things happen at any appreciable rate, you would apply more pressure. And then remember that as the, composition, as the concentration goes up, as you've applied pressure, you have to apply even more pressure to keep that going. There's also going to be a pile of unit conversions here. So get your pencils warmed up and start writing stuff down. Uh, Seawater, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, is 35 grams per liter of uh, dissolved solids. And we're going to assume those dissolved solids are all sodium chloride. That's kind of a big jump. It's mostly sodium chloride, but it is by no means all sodium chloride. But we're going to make our lives slightly simple by doing that. And we're also going to assume that when that sodium chloride is in the seawater, it is completely dissociated. So remember, when we're working out the activity of water, um, if we are making an ideal solution assumption, uh, we're looking pretty much at mole fractions. But when we're looking at ions, we have to account for each ion. You know, so we sort of use uh, normality there when you do that. So make sure as you work out the mole fraction of sodium chloride that you're counting it twice because it's completely dissociated. And then you'll have your activity of your water, you'll be able to figure out your pressure. So please go ahead and do that and reflect on that pressure and remember from there the pressure can only go up. Uh, what do you think of that answer? And what are some challenges to using seawater for uh, drinking and farming? Why, uh, what are some things about that that are good? And what are some things about that that are a little bit more of a challenge? Thanks.